Hello YouTube, this is Trapper Rod with Trapper Rod's Outdoor Pursuits. Today we're in Branson, Missouri, and we're at the History of Fishing Museum. Uh, we're going to talk to Bill here in a minute, he's the curator of the museum, and we're going to take you to a few of the exhibits here and uh, give you a taste of what you'll find at this museum. They've got a lot of interesting things, they've got a lot of first of things. Uh, you'll spend a whole afternoon here, you'll, two or three hours. If you love fishing, you'll spend two or three hours here uh, looking at all of the things. So we're going to take you through a couple of the exhibits and give you a taste of what you'll see. And Okay, hi, this is Bill. I'm the curator here at the History of Fishing Museum. Uh, this is all one man and his wife's uh, collection, Carl White and Beverly. Uh, they've been collecting almost 75 years. We have over 40,000 items here. We go all the way from prehistoric up to about 1970. Uh, we have a lot of the first, the first casting reel, 1840. Uh, we have the first patented fishing lure, 1859. We have the first wooden patented lure, 1883. Uh, we have the first uh, Skeeter Bass Boat, 1949. Uh, we'll see these things from here on, but it's all in chronological order. That's what's so nice about it. And it's the world's most complete fishing tackle collection. Okay, this is all Indian Eskimo stuff. Uh, right at the beginning of uh, fishing, they've been fishing in China for over 3,000 years. We have bone hooks, ivory, flint. These are gorge hooks where they swallow them, they get stuck in their throat. They still use that on the swamp people and stuff like that. Uh, the line they had back then was jute, cotton, silk, linen. Uh, these are halibut hooks. Halibut are the big, huge flat fish from Alaska. They couldn't catch the big ones because the line wasn't strong enough. So they made a gauge hook. They would bait that with octopus. The big fish would just bite over it and slide off. They didn't want the big fish. They wanted the smaller ones that would fit their snout inside of there. Catch them, bring them up, bonk them on the head with a big old mallet. You had to kill them, they'd break legs and things. Abalone shell, that might have been one of your first spoons. Went through the water like that. A lot of people fished out of these pea rows, they called them. They carved them out of trees. In Louisiana, a lot of people use them. They say it, you can even stand up in them. They say it's easy. It's just like riding a skateboard on the water. This is just one section. Trolley sinkers, weights, and plug knockers. You probably know these weights in here. Uh, these are not matches. These are actually lead strips. They still use these for fly fishing. Trolley sinkers, Lake Michigan, Chicago. Lake Michigan was dug out by ice. Uh, this, it goes from shoreline to 60 feet deep and about 20 feet. They would throw an anchor out in the deep water, then they would run these trolleys down with either bait or smelt uh, nets on them and pull them up. It was like an adjustable trot line. This is a gang fisher. You'd put minnows in there and, and hang minnows from hooks on here. The fish thought they were getting a, a group of fish. That red bobber at the bottom of that, that's actually a coffee percolator top. If you ever lost a fishing lure, you might have used a plug knocker. You would run this thing down, try to get your hooks caught in the chains and stuff, yank that thing out. The first uh, fishing lures cost about a week's worth of wages, so people went after them. If you got serious, this thing would probably pull out a whole tree, but that's what they were doing. Corks, floats, and bobbers, that's just another section. Uh, the first bobber was invented by a Benedictine nun in 1496. That was her job to catch fish for the convent. We have the original story in one of the books over here. Uh, we had whistlers. When the fish pulled it underwater, it went woo, got your attention. Light up bobbers, mermaids. This one here, you would cast next to a log, you would pull it, it would go down, then it would go underneath the log. We had bobbers with little drag chutes on them. When the fish pulled it underwater, it slowed the fish down. And then porcupine quills. They still use these down in Louisiana. You can still buy them at Bass Pro Shop. They have a little wire loop at the top. The line goes through the loop underneath the rubber band. It's adjustable, very sensitive. Just lays on the water like a stick. When the fish pulls it, it just pops up. Very sensitive. Before that, the Indians used turkey quills too. So. There was all kinds of lines way back when. They made line out of jute, cotton, silk, linen. They also use copper wire. It sinks. It's very strong. Uh, Lake Michigan has thousands and thousands of lead balls. They would cast that out and go down to the bottom. When they set the hook, it would break loose by design. Uh, they didn't know it was poison back then. So 
And now they use copper wire still, and they also use leaded weighted line uh, for sinking. This is a picture of Zane Gray. He was a famous Western author, did all kinds of Westerns and movies and things like that. He was also a spokesman for Ashway Line Company. Here's a picture of him with his rod. It's called the Royal Hickory. If you can see how that's bending, I don't know if it would bend like that, but hickory is what they make axe handles out of. He did catch a 758 pound tuna at one time and a great white shark over a thousand pounds. The only thing holding that rod and reel in the boat was that shoulder harness. They also called that the Widowmaker. Fish pulled you over, they'd never see you again. It happened a lot. All right, this is the Royal Hickory. This is the, the Zane, this is Zane Gray's actual rod, it's my understanding. Yes. And it's the same one that's in that, uh, that fishing commercial uh, yeah. over there. And yeah, he was, a spokes he was a spokesman for Ashway Line Company. That rod weighs 50 pounds. It's called the Royal Hickory. That's what they make axe handles out of. I don't know if it would bend like that picture. Uh, the only thing holding that thing in the boat was the leather shoulder harness. I don't know if he can pull that out or not. They also called that the Widowmaker. Fish pulled you over, they'd never see you again, and that happened quite a bit. Uh, we have a picture of Zane Gray. He had a big, huge fish on. He had five people holding him down, trying to keep him in that boat. What about that big old reel? It's kind of interesting. All those reels were specially made. It would take a machinist about three months to build one. That particular reel has two drag systems, one on each side, and it had like 700 yards of either cotton or silk or a blend of line on that. Yeah, this is a hefty piece. <laughs> this is a hefty piece of history right here. It, uh... This is pre-1900s. Uh, jewelers and silversmiths made a lot of lures. Sterling silver minnows, too pretty to fish with. These are all the Kentucky reels. These were all made in Kentucky by watchmakers. It would take them about three weeks to build one. It would take about three months worth of wages to pay for one. They came in real nice leather cases. They were so precise you could hit that handle and it'd spin for a minute. No oil bearings. They used bushings and they used sperm whale oil for the lubricant. came out of the sperm whale brain. Here we have the spoon. J.T. Buell invented the fishing spoon, literally. He would go out fishing, his mom would make him food. He finished his soup, put his spoon in his pocket one time, started paddling, he hit a rock and fell. Spoon fell out, went down, fish took off with it. He got an idea. He then went home and took two of his mom's sterling silver spoons, soldered hooks to them, cut the handles off, the rest is history. He made millions of dollars doing that. We say his mom made soup with a fork for the rest of her life. The first patented spoon was a split spoon at 1840. So all your daredevils and everything, that's what copied these. Also, we have Floyd Ferris Lobb. He, he developed spoons. And his name was Floyd Ferris Lobb. That's where lob your spoon. That's where that saying comes from. Now we're in fly fishing. Uh, we have over 18 different displays of fly fishing going from pre-1900s all the way up to about the 70s. Uh, here's the first perforated uh, Orvis reel, 1873. This reel is neat. This is from 1866. This is the hatch reel. Uh, the line on this is woven horsehair. They would take the horse tail, uh, cut it off in the fall. Uh, they would put it in a clamp mechanism and then weave like a 100 foot ponytail out of it. Very strong. They used white male horses. They fed them more proteins. Uh, the, that white hair was supposed to be more supple and the edges are more coarse so they stayed together more easily. We also have, uh, these are not monofilament, that's silkworm gut. In Asia, they had a moth with a body the size of a football. That gut sack was stretched about 35 feet. They would stretch that and put that in what they called a gut engine. It was like a rope twister and make line out of it. So this is the first manufactured bass boat, 1949. If y'all ever heard of Skeeter bass boats, Skeeter number one. Uh, they used to be made in Shreveport before they were in Kilgore, Texas. Uh, we found this thing in a barn with a hole in it with a tree growing through it. And we took it to Fort Worth to a guy that specialized in antique boats. He rebuilt the boat, that's all lacquered. He also found the serial number B501 
He went crazy. He called Carl. Carl went crazy. Carl called Skeeter. They didn't even know what he was talking about. So Carl cut out the sign and sent it to him. They, they then said, you know, they'd offered Carl a $40,000 bass boat for that. And Carl just said, those are everywhere. Uh, this is also the first boat with a live well in it. It's basically a wooden box that you filled up with a bucket. Uh, it's a very strong built boat. Uh, they built this boat for Bonnie Moore. Uh, Bonnie only had one leg. Uh, they made this thing super solid and stable for him. It's a heavy, heavy and a stable boat. Up north they tend to call these uh, duck boats for duck hunting. Also, here's one of your first fish locators. Lean over the boat, locate your fish. Wireless. We have all kinds of motors starting to, the first motor was actually electric, it was six volts. Uh, go to gas motors, all kinds of different motors. Uh, this one happens to be a kit motor. Evan Rude made it. It was a half horsepower motor. Tackle box, rods, and whatever else you could cram into there. You might use that with this boat. This is the Link Canoe. This is 13 pieces. It all came unlatched. Fit in those canvas bags. That was made for airplanes, so you fly into Canada or Alaska. Yes, it leaked. All wooden boats leaked. You had to let that thing soak to seal. The skin on this is actually phenolic resin. That's what they were making boards for circuits four years ago. Edwin Link invented the flight simulator. So they were busy during World War II for training. Uh, when the World War was over, they needed something to keep their people busy. They made over 4,000 of these boats. Uh, also these chairs, these happen to be Zane Gray's chairs also. We also have all types of motors. These were people-powered motors. This one fit on the front of the boat. You pedaled it. You steered it with this. This one, you put it on the back of the boat. You pedal it. You steer it with your butt. Pretty cool. No matter which way ever you leaned, that's the way it went. A lot of kayakers are interested in that. The Grimes electric oar. That was kind of the beginning of electric motors. That was a starter motor. Had a shaft went down with a big prop. The only problem, it took a 500 pound wet cell railroad battery to operate it. Over here is what they called the first outboard motor. It was made in 1900. Uh, it was called the submersible. The motor was underwater, it was six volts. The wires came through here, you steered it with the wires, and that was your speed control. Did about four miles an hour, but took a 500 pound wet cell railroad battery to operate it. It wasn't that big, but how you got a 500 pound battery in a boat, we'll never know. So that was the first outboard motor before gas ever came along. Yes. They were working with electricity. Yes. I'll be darned. And then they got tired of hauling around that battery, I guess. A Waterman was the first gas powered motor. They said it was white gas. It's kind of what, you know, kerosene or whatever. Uh, the first ones were air cooled. They all fried. So they had to put a water jacket on them. They had a big prop and a big rudder, no reverse. To start that, you would whip that flywheel to get it started, kind of like a Papa Johnny or a hit and miss. When it ran, it, <laughs> they called it the coughing Sarah. Took two of these cups of oil per tank of gas, and it had a spark advance like a Model T. Did about four miles an hour. Then Evanrood, I don't know if you heard the story on Evanrood, Oli, O-L-E, Evanrood had a girlfriend named Bess. She liked ice cream. He would row her across the lake, get her ice cream, row her back. It was about five miles. It was killing him. He had to figure out a better way. That's how he came up with his outboard motor. They all cranked like this. That thing went around, around, around. They called those knuckle busters too. Two strokes start either forward or reverse. They start either direction. So this was reverse, go this way, forward, this way. They got married. She got tuberculosis. They sold the company, moved to Colorado, get her up in the altitude, it worked. All that time he was designing a new motor, a two cylinder. They couldn't use their own last name because they sold the rights to it. So she came up with Elto, Evanroot Light Twin Outboard. They were all two cylinders. I don't know how light they were. Single cylinder did seven miles an hour, or four miles an hour, I'm sorry. Two cylinder did seven miles an hour, it was a big deal. Uh, here's a picture of Ole Evanroot in his three piece suit and his fedora hat. That was a Sunday go to church and then get in your boat and ride your motor. The rest of the story, his wife's dad owned a little company called Briggs & Stratton. Uh, they also started Johnson Motors. They also started uh, 
Lawn Boy Lawnmower Company. So that fish we just saw, uh, that's a copy of the world's largest bass that nobody saw. 22 pounds, four ounces. It's the George Perry story, caught in 1932, Montgomery Lake, Georgia. Uh, there was supposed to be a picture of him in this book that uh, his Bill Babb wrote a book on him. There was supposed to be a picture of George Perry. We have one small problem. George Perry never smoked. Carl also did an article in Bassmasters about that. He caught that thing on the Creek Chub Fintail Shiner. That one had a rubber tail and side fins on it. Those would rot off, so they discontinued that lure. Then Creek Chub came out with the wiggle fish with the metal tail. Then he said he caught it on that one. In 1932, that was in Montgomery Lake, Georgia. That would have had to have been a Florida strain bass. There were no Florida strain bass in Georgia at that time. The biggest bass that's been caught since then in almost 90 years has been 18 pound, five ounce, and that was a Florida strain bass. And then the picture. Oh, well, that... also he's the only guy that's won it twice. He said that that bass weighed 13 pounds, 14 ounces. Uh, we don't think so. We measured the tackle box. We think it should weigh under eight pounds. So that may just be a fish story. Another fish story, yeah. So this is a picture of Carl's girlfriend, Marilyn Monroe. All fishermen are liars. Lori Rapala or Rapala, however you say it, he started making these lures out of pine bark. It wasn't consistent enough. Then they started making them out of balsa wood, which is still the most realistic wood there is for fishing lures. He wrapped these things with chocolate wrappers. You can actually see the foil wrapper under them. Then they wrapped that with cellulose tape. In 1962, it was so hot they did an article on it in Life Magazine that happens to be the number one selling Life Magazine of all time. It wasn't because of the fishing lure, it was because of Maryland. When that came out, all the guys that were looking at that were fishermen. They had orders for over a million of these things. They didn't know what to do. In 1962, they started renting these for $100 a day, and if you lost it, it was $150. I've actually had people in here that rented them for that much. They wore those lures If out. you have any questions, uh, you can call us. Uh, you can text me if you have an old lure or something, you want to know what it's worth. You can text my cell phone at area code 417-263-0817. And my name is Bill Bramsch. I'm the curator here. Thank you.